name is Jacqueline Lewicki, and I was born in Paris and I'm a Holocaust survivor. Good morning. Welcome to Our Lives, Our Future. I'm sponsored by the Chula Vista Heritage Museum and the South Bay Historical Society. Hands are clean? Hands are clean. Thank you, Dr. Bronners. I am with Jacqueline Luwiki. Jacqueline Frankel Luwiki, a Holocaust survivor who's got an incredible story. Jacqueline, it's a pleasure to have you here. When were you born? I was born May 5th, 1935, in Paris. Oh. Tell me, what is life like for you from 1935 to 1938, 1939? Do you remember what happened? Yes, I remember a lot. Uh, I, I remember being three or four years old, and I went to the dentist with my father, and I remember holding his hand because I had a pain in my tooth, and we had a cousin who was a dentist, and he pulled out my tooth. Oh my gosh. And then I remember going to the circus one Sunday, and we were waiting for my mother to come down, and she fell asleep because she was very tired, and, uh, and then she came down, and we went to the circus with my father. I remember that. And I remember we used to live in a small apartment and my mother's older aunt was living in the, one of the bedroom in, uh, in that little apartment. And uh, I remember her very well and I was about four years old. And then when I was four and, four and a half, five, the German came into Paris and we, we fled on the road and my father was working for a factory making a metal handle for handbags and he went with this factory and for some reason we found each other outside Paris and I remember being in a cart drawn by a horse and uh, my mother was in the corner breastfeeding my brother and um, my sister was 10 years old then I was five uh, you remember she, all this at the age of five? Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh, don't stop. I'm so sorry I interrupted you. <gasps> she, she, she went for bread and uh, my mother was afraid she got lost. And then she came back and she had eaten all the bread. And then the, the Italian plane were shooting at us. Oh. The Italian were working with the German already and they were shooting at us on the road and, oh, and then Jacqueline. one night we went to to sleep in a barn and then there were French soldiers put his bayonet next to me and my mother was so afraid but I have, I have so many story of the war uh, my mother was told to protect us to put us in Guy Patin, Neuf Rue Guy Patin. So this particular home that they put you in do you want to tell me about this? Yeah, they, they shaved our head, and my sister screamed so much that they thought she had the scarlet fever, so she put her in the hospital. This was in 1942 42. to 1943. Here you are living in the Baroness Edmond de Rothschild home. Yeah. That was meant for children. Yeah. And you're separated from your mom or your mom yeah, is my in mother was hidden by a french lady your mother was hidden by a french lady you and your and sister she didn't come to visit us because they knew that they picked up the mothers and the parents on sundays they, they came but they picked them up the german came with a truck and picked up the, the so parents. if your p mother would have come to say hi to you on sunday they would the germans they would, would have, have been there to, to pick her up I remember 
when when the German came in and, and all the people were the parents were hiding everywhere they could and they pulled them out and put them in the truck and I remember they took this lady on on a chair in the carriage. She, I think she was pregnant and she was screaming and, and I was five years old then. Oh my god, Jacqueline, you're five years old and you've seen so much. I was six years old then already. But uh, they, they took her to the truck and she was screaming. That's why I did, never want, really wanted to be pregnant. And I don't know how I know that she was pregnant, but they, they just sat on a chair and took her to the truck. This is you when yeah. you were a baby, beautiful French mama, papa. And my sister is five years old. And your sister is five years old. Oh, Lord. Your mother and father are beautiful. Yeah. Your your whole family is beautiful. Yeah. And oh my gosh. Have a picture of their wedding too. So your this is their wedding. 1928. They yeah. got married. Mm -hmm. And and then you have the picture with with with, the, with his brothers that were taken. This one. This. one. This one was my mother's wedding with with my father and his two brothers and my aunt and my cousins, and they were all killed in, in Auschwitz. How were you able to keep all the photographs? I don't know. I don't think my mother put everything in a suitcase or a box, and she gave it to a, a French lady, and this is how she kept. This is you and your brother? After the war. After the war. You and your brother. Yeah. Jacqueline, I've interviewed quite a few people. This particular interview is if you have lived a hundred lives. You're five years old, being put in a home. Two homes, two different, two let different me, houses. Jacqueline, let me ask you, what is it like when you're that age and you're without your mother, you're without your father, you want to know, do you even think? What happens to your brain? You, you, you don't think. You become like wood, okay? You have absolutely no voice. You have no voice, okay? You don't exist. That's why it took me 80 years to, to, to get to myself. It took you 80 years to be able to now talk about no no I, what I talk, happened I talked about that all my life I had 20 more than 20 therapists because I wanted to kill myself many many times oh Jacqueline I wanted my therapist to explain to my son what where I was and what I was going through Jacqueline can you tell me what happened from 1942 to 1945? Let's get that out of the way. For one year after, after we were in those homes, they sent us to the country in a farm. And, they, and the, this organization was supposed to pay them. But this, this organization uh, couldn't function anymore. So the people where we were on the farm, uh, my sister was 13 years old and she was the maid for 12 people and and she would steal sugar and milk for us and a year later when a cousin and, and she warned my sister not to write to anybody because she would give us to the Germans oh my gosh and I don't remember how my sister 13 years old sent a letter to one of the cousins who was French, and she came to get us a year later, and, and she couldn't even touch us. We were we had boiled in, in lice every, everywhere. And when my mother took us, took my sister to the doctor, she, she, he said that she had three months to live. And she proved him wrong. Yeah, she she did everything to save my sister. Oh, Jacqueline, this is horrific. And then I was put with different women because I couldn't stay with my mother in Paris. 
They had some friends who rented a small room in a hotel. One room with no, no water, no to the toilet outside and no heat. So I used to go and visit, but I was staying with different women. What's that like, Jacqueline? You feel nothing. No, because I don't exist. Your Some childhood is robbed, your youth is robbed. And, and after that, I went to work with my mother when, when I was 15, and, and, and I got all my mother's life story, but I didn't exist either. Because I was working at the sewing machine with my mother. Sure. So 1945 comes along. You're now 10 years old. Yeah. So we had, we had moved to uh, Place d'Italie uh, on the corner of Paris and um, on Rue Michel. And I was 10 years old, and that's the liberation of Paris. And the Germans were shooting from the steeple to the American soldiers down there in the courthouse. When did you realize that you had your I, I physical never freedom? I realized it because I'm still living with, with, with Auschwitz in my head. You know, every time I have a pain, I, I think about the pain that the, the people in Auschwitz were suffering. Who did you lose in Auschwitz? My father, my your uncles, father, my aunt, and your my uncle. two cousins. Wow. Did you cry a lot? No, I never cried. You never cried? No, my mother said I never cried. I remember being with my mother when there was a knock at the door in that little uh, uh, hotel where she lived. And I used to go uh, along the Seine River to pick up wood to make fire, you know. And then I had to go back to this lady because I had, there was no room for me to stay there because they only had one bed and my sister was watching my little brother. And my mother used to go to work at night she worked on the sewing machine and there was only electricity at night. When was the last time you saw your father? I, I saw my father uh, when I was four or five years old, I don't remember. Do you remember when he was taken, when he no, left? No, no. I remember going, going to, with my mother to see my, the, the building where my father in Drancy. 1945. 1945, I started to go back to school. And before I turned around, the Red Cross showed some children and they sent them to Sweden in Norway to recover. So I went to Sweden for six months. What was that like? It was wonderful. It was, it was like being in heaven. Did you miss your mother? No, I didn't miss my mother. Were you with your sister? No, by myself. By yourself, and basically whatever you wanted, they did whatever they could for you. Yeah, they kept us in a quarantine for two weeks, you know, to see if we were, and they gave us a brand new suitcase with clothes in, and then they dropped me off in, on that farm, and I woke up, and, and I say, where's the toilet, you know, and they understood me, even though. That. And then there was Maria. Maria was 15 years old, and and she took care of me. 52 years later, I went to visit. Maria was a caregiver? No, uh, Maria was the daughter. The daughter of the people where you lived? Yeah, on the farm. On the farm? Yeah, in La Olme. And 52 years later, you go back to visit her? Yeah, and I wrote the, the ode, ode to Maria. What's that like? Poem. What's that like to see somebody that you haven't seen for 52 years? Did you feel you like know, you were I, one? Yeah, Did you feel like yeah. you were bonded as one? Yeah, yeah, because Maria was, was uh, she was wonderful. And, her, and there was the, her younger brother and her older brother. And I stayed there three months on the farm when I was going around the countries. Was it beautiful? Yeah, I have the cabin where I stayed there. Did you feel the love? Yes, it was love. So now it's time to go back to Paris. Correct? Yeah. Three months later? Six like months six later. Six months later? Yeah, and, and I had a hard time because I was speaking Swedish. <laughs> and they started to tell me, speak French, you speak know. Speak French, right. So you come back home and you get and to my, be with your my mom. Mother, my mother had met my stepfather 
and she was with this man because my she received the paper that my father disappeared Had just died mm -hmm. yeah perished so you have a new father yes that father that I fought with all the time you fought with him because he was he was from May too so he was a Taurus he was a Taurus <laughs> <laughs> we know those Taurus is they're like bulls. So, so what happened is you're getting along with your mom, you're not getting along with him, but are you all living together in the same house? Yeah, we were living together and then the kitchen was the factory. They had sewing machines and but then then they were not allowed to work in the in this apartment, so they had to to take a little shop somewhere else. And that was when I barely saw my mother too because she worked from morning to night. Tonight. But Madame, you were a French seamstress. You were sewing in Paris. No, I was I was a factory worker. You were a factory worker. Yeah, I, I hear you. A, a, you know, but I had I was working very, very fast. And when I came to New York, I worked in the factory. What company did you work for in New York? Oh, I worked in many factories, but I worked in factory where they made overcoats and I made pockets. And Peace I used work. to make $75 a week. R that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that is a, a lot. A secretary was making $45. 40, 45. So, how did you get from Paris to the United States? How did you. My, my mother, and I guess the whole family decided to come to the United States, and my Aunt Pauline, who was the sister of my father, did the papers and as I was a single person it only took me six months to get my visa oh nice but the rest of the people they had to wait five years so you came over with your mom by myself by yourself wow here's, my, here's me coming back is uh, this one here we go here you are by yourself, on the this Queen Mary. on the Queen Mary, this beautiful Jacqueline wow. Frankel at the time. Yeah, five wow. five days on the ship. Five days on the ship was it wonderful? Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. And a year and a half later, I took the Queen Elizabeth to go back to France because I miss my mother. So you saved up enough to take a ship. Out of curiosity, what did it cost to take a ship? From New York to... I don't remember. You don't remember? Wow. I don't remember. But I went and I had enough money to come back in case I didn't want to stay in France. You were a good saver. You really saved. Yeah. yeah. So you're in New York. Do you meet Mr... No, my, my, my husband was French, a French-Jewish man, young man, who came to America and when he was 15. He came to his uncles, him and his brother. They came to the uncle in Sioux City, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's where I ended up after I got married. <laughs> Sioux City, Iowa. I love the way you say that with a French accent. <laughs> Sioux City, Iowa. <laughs> wow. So, so we now met, you're we in met Sioux in City. Paris because okay. my, um, his, he came to visit his grandmother in Paris, and my mother knew his grandmother and his aunt. Was it love at first sight when you saw him? Yeah, I guess so. Uh -huh. It was also my way out because I didn't want to stay in France. Right. So my mother didn't want to let me go without the Jewish wedding, so we had the Jewish wedding. Oh, Mazel tov. Because he was getting out of the army, and I couldn't marry him because I was not an American. Right. So when we came back to uh, 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 Iowa, then we got the papers. Did you like Iowa? No, I, <laughs> I, I worked in the factories there. Uh, I was making the centennial dresses. <laughs> wow. And then I got pregnant and, and, and I kept saying, you know, we have to leave, we have to leave. So by May, we went back to New York. Oh my gosh. And my son was born in November. Where in New York? What city? In Rockaway. Rockaway. Okay. So how do you get from Rockaway to San Diego? 
Oh, that, that was in 1976. In 1976 you came to San yeah, Diego. Yeah, because my brother was sick. He had a breakdown, and my, I had some cousins here in L.A. That, that got in touch with me and told me to come and take care of him. You so. are probably one of the greatest givers because you give, you give, you give. I, you I, don't know how much I give. <laughs> I, I can sense it. Because, because, you know, I mean, I, I have pity on people and I keep giving them. And it's already a few times that I give them to, you know, I, don't, I cannot stop because they need for the rent, they need for the car. And I was lucky that I had enough money to help them. You're an ama- you're just My mother was a giver too. My yeah. mother was a giver. So it's in the genes. It it you you I don't know how to say this, I'll say it. You give before you think. If somebody comes to you oh, yeah. and they need help, it's like yeah, absolutely. And then maybe uh, you'll think I about have it. I to tell you the story about my mother. I was visiting some cousins and they had a factory and you know, they were seasoned when when there was a lot of work. And then when there was no work, there was no money. So my mother went to visit that cousin and um, she saw that they had packed of work, you know, to do that, to, to sew. And she said, what's the matter, Moshe? So he said, so he, he said, we don't have money to, for, to pay the electricity. So my mother had a little diamond. She went down and she, she pawned it. it and brought the money for them to pay the electricity. To pay for the electric bill. Oh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, you said something earlier that you live with Auschwitz. Yeah, yeah. I wrote an article that I wrote. It, it's in my cells. And you have found a way, as you mentioned earlier, that you didn't want to live anymore, and that's something we don't do, but you found a way to heal yourself. Yeah, well, I had a lot of therapists, and sometimes, I, I remember a long time ago when I lived in Los Angeles, and I, this therapist kept me for three days because she wanted to protect me. For three days. Can I ask you who was your favorite therapist? They were all wonderful. I, I taught them a lot. You taught them a lot. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. Jacqueline, I know there's a gift in you as you're speaking to our viewers. Tell us the gift of having strength. Well, and I wanted to read that. Okay, let's go it. find it. July 30th, 2015. The courage to survive. I would think that it takes courage to survive day after day life's tribulations. But I said, no, it is not courage. It is destiny. It is the inner knowing, the inner drive of human beings and as well as animals and plants on this planet that drives us forwards in life, whatever it takes to live until the time of death. This human nat- natural drive inside of us, that vibrant part which takes almost a lifetime to know and understand, that is the important factor which c- carries us through life. From the moment a seed is appear or is created, ready to grow, its natural process is to push toward life, to push itself forward and be pushed by nature to to fully be alive. We are that seed that by accident or by choice grows and becomes either human, an animal reproducing in many species or fruit Uh, bearing trees. We are life. This force within us is the power that helps overcome the tribulation and the challenges, the pain and helps our recovery. It is the learning experience of this life. 
The road of this life is paved with rocks and stone, some small and some big, and some very big, but we overcome them and we go over them to continue our journey. When I tell myself that this life is too hard and that I cannot make it, the other part of me looks at the ray of light coming from the sun to show me the way, to say it's okay, and the next step makes me stronger. Go, my child, and it does not matter how old we are because we are all children of life. So, as I sit here, writing and pondering on what I want to say to you, but most of all to me, what I want to convey and understand is that Gandhi said when someone asked him, what is your message? He said, my life is my message. My story is my message. Hear me, please. I have something to say. Listen and learn from my mistake and from my joys. Follow my story from my birth and you will discover that what it means that either it takes courage to life or life is a destiny. A road we are forced to take, will or no will. And here at 80, what do I have to give you? What wisdom can I share about this long life? Some people die at one years old or less, and some people die at 20, while some people live until 100. What are the lessons to learn from my experiences? What do I have to give you as a wandering Jew, a tale of a little girl lost in the vast universe? So what is life about? Jacqueline. I was crying when I read it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Jacqueline, Jacqueline Lewicki has an incredible book. Can you buy this on Amazon? Yeah. This is your book. It's called Jacqueline Lewicki. The it's called Alomen. Alomen. The Angel Book, Oneness and Love, The Allow Man. The Allow, Allow Man. Yeah. Messages from the Angels. We are all one. You one that wakes up in the middle of the night and starts writing, three o'clock in the morning you get a thought, you get an idea? No, no, no I, I usually in early in the morning, in the morning. I used to write. Uh huh. And because that's the time that, you know, that you, you don't put any stuff, but you are clear. Is your writing, is that you dig deep in your soul, you're able to transform it with your hand, pen, computer, and you're able to get the words out. Would you say that was your best therapist, that you were your best person? No, I need people. You need people. I need people. Jacqueline, what's your day like now? What? Tell me a typical day with Jacqueline. What's it like if I were to visit you for 24 hours? What would happen? Every minute is a new, a new life. Uh huh. I, I don't have any a routine, and I, 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 I need to do more exercise. But I go to physical therapy to do the exercise. Okay. But as far as your writing, you spend a lot of your time writing. Yeah. How many and hours I a see, day do I you see, spend I writing? I see that I can sit at 6 or 7 o'clock at night and end up at 12. So you could go for like 5, 6 hours straight writing at night. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, it's difficult with the computer because uh, they, they have their own mind too, the computer. Can I ask you something? Do you compare yourself to other Holocaust survivors? I don't know how Holocaust survivor who came out of the camp can have kind of normal life, you know, get married and have children and they stick with the Jew Jewishness, with the synagogue. You know, I grew up with no religion because it was a survival time. My parents came out of Poland. They, it was, they were on survival. 
I never heard the word kosher until I came to America. <laughs> wow. And my whole life has been destroyed by, by my pain because I carry the pain of Auschwitz. My anger to God because he killed my father and I didn't have the, the same Who died in Auschwitz. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the same fulfillment. I didn't have the warmth. My mother was wonderful, but I didn't have her either because she worked very hard. And, she, and when I worked yes. with her, I had to push her back home because she was she was so worn out. This was it, 1942. Yeah, this was in 1942, and my mother sewed the dresses. And she Imagine made the dresses. Imagine how much courage she needed. Yeah, when you're because supposed to be in... Because she wanted to take that picture, and, and that's my father's picture with my brother, and, and, and she wanted to give it to my father. Oh, Lord. If you look carefully... So, the bro the, your brother is holding a photo of the father. You know, you look at this and you go, okay, beautiful dresses, beautiful mother. All of a sudden you're zooming in and you're saying, this is incredibly painful. So your question is, how do Holocaust survivors turn their life around? Yeah, and you listen to Edith Egger, she said there are, there are no um, victims. You know, she was able to forgive I don't know, you know, I've been going to the science of mind for 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, spiritual, and I have not been able to forgive any, anything. And, and, and for, for some reason, all the books are coming at me. You know, I have picked up a book which the man who went into uh, Auschwitz, he, he changed a young American soldier went into Auschwitz. He changed clothes with 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 with, with the victim to find out what was going on there. Right, but I do know that you are an amazing woman. You're a very giving woman. You are a very loving woman, and for you to even ask that question is wanting to know yourself you're 85 years old and you just want to know what does it take to find happiness what is it going to take and i got to tell you i think maybe the answer do you listen to a lot of music yeah i love music when you listen to music you basically hear the voices of what you talk about angels and i ask you something if you never get your question answered, will it be okay? Oh yeah, I know, because I, I'm at peace right now. That's the most important thing. I am thing, at peace. To I'm, be not, at I'm peace. not looking anymore and I don't want to kill myself. No. I don't walk around. I won't let you. <laughs> wanting to, to put stone on my, jump into the water, you know, sure. to kill myself. I, I don't have that right now. And you won't. I, Don't uh, say right now, okay. and you won't. Okay. You won't. Okay. No, no, of course not. You know, this, you're, you're just an incredible person. And I, I hear that now more and more, but that's all I have. I don't have any friends. You yes, know. you do. You got me. <laughs> Thank you, you have me. Thank you. And you know, sometimes in places, that you don't look, you'll maybe look and you'll find them. Let me ask you something. If you had to give a message to students right now, the overall top message, what would you tell if this room were filled with a thousand people? What's the most important thing you would want to say to them? You know, um, this is what Eli Wiesel said. He said, he said, friendship is more important than love. And not only that, but I, I think that regards for another, you know, respect, respect. But what does Jacqueline say? 
Ellie Wiesel, we can read. I want to know what Jacqueline would tell our viewers. Help people. Help people. It doesn't make any difference what you get back. No. All you got to do is keep helping. Volunteerism. You got that from your adopted father, Dr. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ivan uh, Shire. Ivan Shire, yeah. And um, I think... And my mother. My mother was a giver. And, my... and your mother was a giver. So... And that, I don't know. You know, I cannot say that that's why she survived, because there were six million Jews that were givers too. I know. And they died. So, you know, we don't have the answers. We just have the questions. Right? Yeah. You're a lovely woman. Will you promise to come back? Yes, I will. Really? I, I like to meet you, you know, and I like to spend some time with you. I would love that. Yeah. I think you're beautiful. My new friend, my dear Jacqueline, here's my hand. You are incredible. We'll go ahead and look out and say thanks for watching. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Namaste. Namaste.